Hey everybody, welcome back to our Earthquake Notes Part 2. There were there were quite a few notes for Earthquake, so I broke it up into two different parts. Um, this is the end, the last set of notes for our plate tectonics unit, so congratulations on finishing the notes for our very first unit. So let's get started with Earthquakes Part 2. Swabot! Students will be able to describe the different characteristics of seismic waves and describe how an epicenter of an earthquake is determined. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about is a seismograph. And a seismograph is the instrument that records seismic waves. So it can determine how long and how strong an earthquake is. So many years ago, they looked kind of like this. They're, they sit on a base and different cities have seismographs around the city or different places. And if this base moves, then there's like kind of a weight here with a pen and it and a piece of paper. And so if it moves it, it makes a recording on a piece of paper. So today the seismographs have come a long way in technology and now they're more electronic, but it's still like a, some sort of marking device when it's moved makes a line. And so depending on how big those lines are, you can tell how big an earthquake is. So how do we know where an epicenter is? Last time we talked about the epicenter and the focus and the difference between those two. But where do we know, like if we have an earthquake, we wanna know what city or where it was. So scientists use a thing called triangulation to figure out where the epicenter of an earthquake is. So let's say we've got seismographs in Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, and Portland, and they picked up seismic waves of an earthquake. Based on those seismic waves, they can tell how far away from the seismograph the earthquake was. So, so because of the strength of the seismic waves, they can make a circle. So for example, this seismograph in Salt Lake City they can tell how many miles away it was, and so they draw this circle. Well, it can be anywhere on the circle, so one, one seismograph is not enough. Let's say they had two seismographs, so they got the one for Salt Lake City and the one for Portland. So they've done the circle for Portland, but if we just have the two, it could be either here where those two, inter those two circles intersect, or it could be here. So that's why they need the third seismograph, and where those three circles intersect is the point of the epicenter of the earthquake. So that is called triangulation. So think tricycle triangulation three. How the, the thing that we use to measure earthquakes is called the Richter scale and it measures the strength, like how strong it was or what's called the magnitude. And it goes from one to 10, I guess maybe zero to 10. But each increase from like one, one to two is actually 32 times greater than the previous number. So which is why we use the decimals because be, uh, between a six and a seven is a really huge range. And so they can narrow it down with using a decimal number. And this little chart down here kind of talks about destruction um, along an earthquake. So there may not be very much destruction until we get to in the four or five range and then anything over nine, even anywhere in on this side, we can get a lot of destruction in an earthquake. And now we're gonna talk about those, what causes that destruction. So seismic waves. We've talked a little bit about seismic waves in the past with layers of the earth and how they use seismic waves to tell what the different layers are. Um, the very first seismic wave is called a P wave or primary wave. And it is the first to arrive, it's the fastest wave. And it can move through solids and liquids and it shakes the ground back and forth. So I've got a little tiny slinky right here, but P waves basically go like this, back and forth. So that is a P wave. The second type of wave is called an S wave. Secondary waves, so P equals primary, S equals secondary. They are slower than a P wave and they can only move through solid layers. And it moves like this, up and down. S waves. The final type of wave are called surface waves and they are the slowest waves to arrive. They can only travel through the crust, they can't go through any other layers of the earth, but they are what's really responsible for the majority of the damage of an earthquake. So 
Um, I'll try to do it with my, my slinky a little bit, but a lobe wave really goes like this. And a Raleigh wave is kind of like the motion of like an ocean wave. So those two types of waves cause, is what cause a major destruction in an earthquake. So I've got a little um, diagram here that shows some cars that give you a good example. Like the P waves are just basically going in a straight line, so they're going to come first. The S waves are going back and forth a little bit, and so it's going to be a little bit slower. And then finally we have the surface waves, and they are moving a lot. Those waves are moving a lot, and so they're the slowest, and they um, therefore cause the most damage. So hopefully you can look at this picture and be able to tell which wave is fastest, which wave would cause the most damage. All right, a tsunami. A tsunami is a powerful wave caused by an earthquake in the ocean. Um, those waves can travel 450 miles per hour, and they can be very destructive. And we have an example here. In Japan in 2011, there was an 8.9 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Japan. So that's a pretty big earthquake. Well, that earthquake displaced a lot of water. It made a lot of water move. And that tsunami then hit the east coast of Japan here. More than 15,000 people were killed, and one of the reasons that we talk about this earthquake still today is that there was some, a nuclear power plant in Fukushima that was damaged from that tsunami. So sometimes we still talk about that damage. All right, prediction. There is absolutely no way scientists can predict an earthquake right now at this point. They cannot say at noon tomorrow, there's going to be an, a level 8 on the Richter scale magnitude earthquake in San Francisco, California. Now, scientists can predict what areas are most likely to have a, an earthquake, and they might say, oh, we're kind of due for an earthquake in this area, but there's really no way for scientists to give warning ahead of time to a city that's about to have a big earthquake. However, animals, after an earthquake has happened, Sometimes people notice that their animals were behaving strangely before it happened. And so animals may have some sort of sixth sense about when an earthquake is going to happen. And there's been some scientific research on this area. And maybe we'll find out more. And maybe animals will be able to help humans predict earthquakes sometime in the future. But as of right now, we just, we just can't predict them. All right, discussion questions. How was an epicenter determined? How does a tsunami form? And can you describe the three different types of seismic waves? And then finally, our meme, there was an earthquake in Utah in March 2020, a, a very minor earthquake. Um, so here we've got our meme. And thank you for watching the part two earthquake notes. And remember, science rocks.